the consequence of that is that capital will move from the low profit lines into the high profit lines that expands production in those lines. In order to find buyers for the additional goods, what has to happen to prices? They come down. Uh, when costs fall, when costs fall, uh, unless it's a patented process or a secret technology, uh, in fairly short order, uh, prices are going to come down uh, to correspond with the lower costs. And so if we had uh, wage rates uh, broadly falling, uh, that would reduce costs and prices would decline commensurately. Uh, when you have improvements in the productivity of labor, uh, prices also decline. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic example in our own experience is uh, the prices of uh, a, a megabyte or a gigabyte of uh, a hard drive space or uh, of RAM. Uh, what's happened to these things uh, over the last 20 years? Prices diminish. Uh, prices diminish tremendously. Uh, the, the prices of oil products are governed uh, primarily by the price of crude oil. Uh, what happens to gasoline at the pump as uh, crude oil goes up or down? Uh, it's following. Uh, so uh, most prices are uh, tied uh, to costs. As costs go down, prices will go down. And even if they're not tied to costs, as employment goes up, production goes up, supply goes up, and more supply will drive prices down. Uh, yes? Yeah, th there would be more competition. That's exactly true. And look at it further. Uh, in terms of the relation between cost and price, uh, you know, I gave you an example of what's happened to the unemployment rate and so on. Now, uh, what has happened uh, to the level of cost of production in real terms, in terms of uh, how much labor it takes per unit of product over the last 200 years? We've already established, really, the amount of labor required per unit of product is on the order of 1% or even less. Uh, so this is a huge reduction in the level of real costs. Uh, do you think the effect of this has been to uh, show up simply as an enlargement of profits? Uh, what, w what percentage of the price of products would now be profit if we had a 99% reduction in uh, the basic cost, the basic unit costs, and if this served simply to enlarge profit? 99% of the price of everything would be profit. Uh, do you think that the percentage of the price of things that is profit today is uh, significantly different than the percentage of the price of things that was profit 100 or 200 years ago, yes. on an average? No. No, it isn't. The, the rate of profit has not undergone any major change up or down uh, over this period of time. And uh, see, uh, what happens when uh, costs are cut, uh, the consequence is going to be, in fairly short order, prices will be cut. Uh, you can make a high profit by cutting costs so long as you alone have the ability to produce at the lower cost. If, you, if you're in the market first with the lower cost method, so long as you remain alone with it, you can make higher profits. But uh, you're not going to remain alone for very long. Even if you have a patent, the patent is going to expire. And when it does, uh, the price is going to come down. Yes. Maybe a good example of that is people moving their productions overseas to get. Can you maybe talk about that? Well, uh, they try to move production overseas to take advantage of lower costs. And smaller companies uh, maybe can't do that yet. Okay, but how does that show up too? To the extent that uh, we now are producing uh, television sets, microwave ovens, uh, various other things outside the country at much lower costs, uh, what's been the effect on the price of these things? Uh, they're much lower. Uh, you're getting uh, television sets, I think, uh, in some places for $70, a microwave oven for $40. Uh, the prices of some of these things are so low that uh, it doesn't pay to repair them. Uh, just junk them and get a new one. Uh, like if, you, uh, if something happens to your TV remote, 
uh, no one will repair it. It's cheaper to get a new one produced outside the country. Uh, so uh, the lower costs uh, show up as uh, lower prices. Now, if we're not dealing with married couples, uh, let's suppose we have uh, some immigrants. Uh, what uh, do the immigrants need? Uh, what, will, what will be necessary uh, to accommodate the immigrants in the labor force? Well, wage rates would have to fall. Uh, but what's the effect of the immigrants on production? Uh, there's more production, so we should expect prices to fall. Now, it's a little more complicated than that. It'll depend on what sort of immigrants. Uh, if the immigrants are all unskilled workers, uh, then the wage rates of unskilled labor will decline relative to those of skilled and professional level labor. Uh, uh, that'll go on for a point, uh, but uh, as the immigrants become assimilated, uh, what happens to the children of the immigrants? Uh, will they all have to be unskilled workers, uh, or will many of them be moving higher up, and maybe many of the immigrants themselves after a while? Now, uh, it's difficult to argue uh, for f totally free, unrestricted immigration the way things now stand, because we have a welfare state when the immigrants cross the border, uh, they're automatically entitled uh, to all kinds of free public welfare benefits. Uh, they crowd the emergency rooms, uh, supposedly uh, their children are in the public schools, etc. And so that can represent a higher burden to the taxpayers. But suppose the taxpayers didn't have to meet those burdens. Suppose uh, all of these things would be done uh, privately. If you couldn't afford medical care, well, you have to work it out. The uh, taxpayers are not going to provide it. Uh, so whatever the immigrants get, they have to earn. They have to earn. So they're not going to be any kind of public burden. Well, now, uh, I would say that uh, over a period of time, uh, maybe it would take a generation uh, for the effects to be fully felt, uh, what is the effect of having people uh, be able to live and work in a uh, society and culture that is substantially freer and more rational than the one that they've come from? in terms of their ability to develop and apply their talents. Able to produce more they'll, they'll develop their talents to a higher degree. And to the extent that they're doing this at a high level, uh, to the extent that we end up as the result of uh, greater immigration, to the extent that within a generation or so we have uh, more uh, scientists, more inventors, uh, more uh, highly innovative, productive businessmen, uh, what will be the effect of the immigration on the productivity of labor and standard of living in general as we allow a little time to go by. It'll be higher. I just think, I suppose the United States had closed its doors to immigration uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Again, uh, would we have had Andrew Carnegie uh, to develop the steel industry? Uh, would, would we have, have, have had uh, Sikorsky uh, to develop the helicopter? Uh, all kinds of other people, uh, either immigrants themselves or their children or grandchildren. See, free immigration into a free society means we're going to have uh, a vastly more talent flourishing. And this operates to raise the general productivity of labor. Uh, it means more and better machinery, a higher output of goods relative to the supply of labor, a higher general standard of living. Uh, unfortunately, with the kind of economy we have, uh, there are these obstacles in the way uh, that, uh, because many of the immigrants will just be a public burden because uh, we've decided that's the kind of system uh, we're financing. Uh, yes, Mr. Drew. Could you say that with, with the larger employment, employment pool that people would be more likely to find a career that was best suited for their talents rather than a very small pool, people might be forced into careers to suit need that maybe necessarily not what they were best at doing. Well, uh, the larger the participating population, the, the further the division of labor goes, uh, 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 there is a greater chance uh, for people uh, getting into something they like, I would assume. But uh, what's very, very important is the larger the population you have cooperating in the system, the larger will be the absolute number of people working in fields that are uh, acquiring and applying new knowledge. Uh, the larger the absolute number of scientists, engineers, inventors, businessmen, and this means uh, a greater likelihood of new discoveries and new methods, better methods of production. Yes, uh, the gentleman in the back, Mr. Doe. Um, I, I do agree that the two things. One is that um, the immigrants will be more likely to be 
machinery does not take away jobs. That's one. And immigrants do not take away the jobs of individuals in America because immigrants take the jobs that we do not want. Well, that's very largely true. Right. That, that is largely true. But uh, it could also be the case. It doesn't always have to be that way. Uh, certainly, uh, children of immig immigrants, or when they learn the language, uh, they're capable of taking better jobs. But that doesn't mean uh, they'd be taking jobs away. Even if they're doing the kinds of jobs we want to do, uh, there'll be more such jobs. The, the problem we have is that technology advances. Sorry? We have, the problem we have is technology and specialization. And specialization, everybody is... Uh, working on one type of technology. Yeah. Therefore, when the technology, the technology changes, it advances, there's not training. So I think individuals that are trained from the <coughs> technology create new jobs. That's why the unemployment is not by machinery, but the advanced technology. Well, because, because of machinery, economic progress, uh, a variety of things, uh, people will have to change their jobs, uh, they have to learn new skills, and uh, this doesn't mean they first have to be out on the street. Uh, most people are in a position to learn new skills while they still have their jobs. And I'm sure that's a factor for many of you. Uh, you're in a program like this, uh, I would think, because you might have one eye on the possibility of losing your present job. Uh, you want to uh, have greater security uh, for finding an alternative job or a better job. Yes, uh, Ms. Bernard. So you, you brought up the emergency room, which I think is a good example. How do we solve that solution? I mean, where we've got medical facilities, obviously there's a high demand, there's a high need for medical facilities that are closing down due to the demand is so high. Is, do you feel that the pay scale of the well, physicians to operate that is out of sync? Well, this is a whole other major uh, question. And uh, I think I deal with this. Uh, uh, if you look in the index, uh, under medical or doctors. I have extensive discussion uh, why we have the whole medical crisis and uh, I think I go into what <coughs> could be done to alleviate it. And uh, 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 But that would take us into a discussion of the present insurance system. Uh, I just want to, I don't want to get go off on that track because I do want to uh, stay on the subject I have uh, for tonight. Yes? With the, um the service industries experience some of those same price reductions that you're talking about with um, where price level where where there's like more uh, workers and you're talking about how prices would go down is that just for um, produce manufacturing companies? no everything everything uh, certainly uh, to the extent that there are immigrants and they're working <coughs> largely in the service industries uh, that's operating uh, to make prices lower than they otherwise would be. Uh, the reason, you see, we have different fac factors going on at the same time. Uh, there are immigrants coming in. Uh, the birth rate itself is enlarging the population uh, on the part of the people who are already here. So we have a growing labor force from year to year. Uh, now, wage rates are rising in almost every year, even though we have a growing supply of labor. And what explains that? Yes? They call it increased standard of living. No, that is not what explains the rise in money wage rates. Increased productivity. The increased productivity is not what explains the rise in money wage rates. If we had the same number of workers producing Why twice as much, that, that's an increase in productivity. What's the effect of the same number of workers producing twice as much if there's no more money? Prices go down. And prices go down. So what is it that's making prices go up, even though we have more people working and they're working on average with a higher productivity? We have a growing quantity of money. The increase in the quantity of money and volume of spending is outstripping the increase in production and supply, and it's outstripping the increase in labor more than it outstrips the increase in the supply of goods. So uh, wage rates tend to rise more rapidly than prices. Uh, if the, uh, uh, you could work out examples on your own. Uh, uh, let me go now go uh, a little bit further. Uh, here we are. The uh, uh, consumptionists think we have this problem 
how do we uh, move the demand curve? How do we move the demand curve? They think the demand curve is inadequate to the supply. Okay, uh, let's start looking at their methods of moving the demand curve. Well, one very favored method is uh, nothing like a good war. Uh, have you ever heard the argument or the claim that the war is a source of prosperity? Well, you must have, even if you hadn't heard it before this course, if you read Hassett, but you didn't have to read Hassett. Uh, if you just watched PBS, uh, you'd hear it and, and other sources. Well, how is war uh, supposed to uh, be a source of prosperity? What's it supposed to do in terms of this uh, diagrammatic analysis? It will move the demand curve to the right. And uh, that will reduce the extent to which there's a surplus of production. And it may even move the demand curve uh, further to the right than the ability to produce. Now, how is it supposed to do that? Well, in a variety of ways. First, uh, what happens uh, when a country uh, is getting involved in a war and uh, is uh, uh, starting to make a major war effort? Okay, they will have to uh, start producing things like tanks and planes and artillery shells and so forth. And it's thought, okay, well now we need all of this war material. This is really good. It's going to take an awful lot of workers to produce all of these tanks, planes, etc. Uh, so that's going to be that's going to move the uh, demand curve too. See, we go into the war, uh, uh, and all we allegedly need and desire is uh, the monk's habit, uh, our loaf of bread, plus whatever the advertisers have managed to con us into desiring up to that point. But now, on top of all that, we'll need the tanks and planes and artillery shells and the rest. And so maybe now we might have full employment. And then uh, there's a further beneficial effect of war from the perspective of the consumptionist, not from the perspective of uh, anyone who's serious. And this is the destruction that it causes. How is war supposed to make an economic contribution by virtue of its destruction? The rebuilding. Now there'll all be this wonderful work to do of rebuilding everything that's been destroyed. So not only do we have the precious work to do of building the tanks and cannons and whatever, we have the work to do of repairing everything that they've destroyed. This is really a terrific arrangement. Pardon me? There's what many if their economy is down. Well, they can also print the money. They'll print the money. But, pardon me? I said how do you blow up the building that makes it? Well, this is the idea. And then supposedly there's a, a, further, a further way uh, that uh, is not as significant but deserves some mention. Uh, suppose we have a country uh, such as the United States. Uh, it uh, made a major war effort. Uh, we had a huge conversion of our economy uh, to uh, produce war material. Uh, we managed to escape the blessings of having uh, any of our uh, cities destroyed. Uh, the physical destruction uh, on the territory of the United States in World War II, uh, I think was actually less, or uh, on an order of magnitude, of the World Trade Center. Uh, there was the uh, Japanese raid on uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, but that was th pretty much the only uh, destruction of actual American territory. Apart from that, uh, they may have sent over uh, one or two incendiary balloons that caused a fire in some forest in Washington, perhaps. But uh, that was about all they could do uh, in the way of damaging the territory of the United States. So we missed out on all of the uh, good fortune of having to rebuild our cities. I hope you realize that uh, this is said sarcastically. But uh, there was another benefit that we did get uh, in the war uh, in order to meet the demand for war material, the government prohibited uh, the production of new private passenger automobiles. Uh, the 1942 model year uh, ended the day after Pearl Harbor. Uh, there was no 43, 44, or 45 model year. Uh, there was no production of major appliances for civilian use. Uh, there was no uh, new private civilian housing construction going on. Uh, uh, all kinds of goods that people had taken for granted uh, disappeared from the market. Uh, there were no ordinary chocolate bars even. 
Uh, there were shortages of practically everything. You needed ration coupons to buy gasoline, tires, red meat. Uh, uh, when you have shortages, uh, uh, you have people eager to buy things. There aren't enough available in the market to satisfy them. So you don't have to be too fastidious about what it is you're offering. So the quality of anything that's offered uh, went way down. Uh, so that was the situation in uh, World War II. Uh, now, uh, the consumptionists think, well, here we are. Uh, uh, we've managed to get people to desire each year some number of automobiles, washing machines, whatever. And now we have a period of years they can't get any of these things. <coughs> Uh, so they want to buy what they've been unable to get uh, when the war ends. And the consumptionists uh, say, well, this is a great pent-up demand. And so they think, well, that'll be good for a few years after the war. They think that's uh, another way that war contributes to prosperity. Yes, uh, Ms. Buckles. What was the effect then, like, during a war when the men go off to the war? They're not employed here or yeah, at home anymore. So they're off the labor force. Well, that's perfectly true, and uh, that would explain uh, a major reduction in the unemployment rate all by itself. Uh, the, but the uh, government is employing them now. Uh, they're employed in the armed services. Uh, our defense establishment in World War II uh, got up to 15 million. There were 15 million uh, soldiers and sailors. And so if you take that many people away, who otherwise would have been in the labor market, it's no miracle uh, that uh, the unemployment problem uh, evaporated. Now, of course, many people went to work who previously weren't working. A huge number of housewives entered the labor market uh, to make up for the loss of uh, young men. Uh, many more high school students were working. So it wasn't a, a, a total net loss. Uh, there was, it was made up uh, to some substantial extent. Yes, Mr. Sadowski. So what happens to the market when all those soldiers come back? The, um, the unemployment. I mean, all of a sudden, now you have this like saturation of people that just all came back, and now they want to go back. And okay, that's a very good question. Uh, and I remember uh, there were fears that uh, when the war ended and the uh, demobilization occurred, that uh, we would return uh, to large-scale unemployment. And I remember uh, I was a child at that time. Uh, maybe about seven years old or so. And uh, I actually raised that question in a class because I had heard my parents talking about it. Uh, but it didn't materialize. Uh, the people who came back uh, ended up uh, pretty quickly being employed. Now, uh, we'll, we'll see the reason uh, two weeks from tonight. We'll see uh, what, what enabled World War II uh, to be accompanied by the end of the problem of mass unemployment. And then uh, why also we didn't revert to mass unemployment right after World War II. But uh, it was only when the war ended that we achieved real prosperity. Uh, then uh, the economy went back to producing civilian goods. Now, the actual effect of war, uh, we don't need a war uh, to have full employment. Uh, if we have economic freedom, we can have full employment uh, without any uh, stimulation of any kind. Uh, essentially, what do we need to have uh, the quantity of labor demanded uh, made equal to the supply of labor available? <coughs> we need more well, you say we need more demand. What will increase the quantity demanded without taking any artificial steps uh, to boost the demand. If, if wage rates are free to fall, if wage rates are free to fall. Now, uh, you could also think, well, why, not, why don't we just increase the money supply and uh, solve the problem that way? And uh, there are conceivable contexts in which that might work. But uh, what if you didn't want to have a monetary system that the government is free to increase as much as it likes? Suppose, you see, uh, let me give you a kind of analogy. Let's suppose we have a severe crime problem. Now, one possible way of uh, solving the crime problem would be very substantially to increase the powers of the police to arrest suspects. And that might do the job. But, uh, would that be a desirable way 
uh, to accomplish the result. Uh, would we want the police having arbitrary power to arrest people? No. Or would we uh, seek a better way, let them do better detective work, uh, 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 let them do better surveillance, whatever? We don't want the government to have the power of arbitrary arrest, certainly, even if in certain contexts it might reduce the crime rate. Now, even if in certain contexts increasing the quantity of money and volume of spending might reduce unemployment, I don't think it's something that it's desirable, a power that it's desirable for the government to have. We don't want the government able to determine the value of everybody's life savings uh, just because it's increasing the quantity of money. We don't want the uh, quantity of money and its buying power to be a political football. Well, uh, there is traditionally a way to avoid that. And what way is that? What way was that? That was the gold standard. That was the gold standard. So if we were going to maintain the gold standard, if we we're going to maintain the gold standard, an arbitrary increase in the quantity of money is not an option. That's not an option. We have to uh, adjust wage rates to the quantity of money as given by uh, the gold standard and the state of gold production. Now what happens was uh, when we had the gold standard, uh, people uh, would always be screwing with it in one form or another. <laughs> Uh, but they could only do so temporarily, up to a limited point. Uh, they could expand the quantity of money beyond what corresponded to the supply of gold, but they could only do that up to a point. Uh, at some point, if you're going to maintain the connection to gold, you've got to stop expanding the quantity of money beyond the, connection, beyond the supply of gold. But in the periods in which they were expanding it more rapidly than gold, they'd have a boom. Uh, spending would be picking up sharply, business conditions would look good, uh, the stock market might be rising, and the economy got used to uh, this expansion in money and spending. It came to a certain degree to depend on its continuation. But then when you stop it because you're at the limit of the quantity of money that's compatible with the gold standard, uh, the foundation of the boom was cut away. Uh, the stock market would tank, uh, the demand for money for holding would rise, velocity would fall, you'd have a decline in spending. Uh, if the decline in spending is significant, well, uh, to whatever extent it's occurring, business sales revenues fall. What's that do to business profits? They drop. What's it do to cash flow and the ability to repay debt? Uh, those things shrink. So uh, some businesses can fail. And if they owe substantial sums to banks, what happens to the banks? They can fail, and what does that do to the quantity of money? I mean, that falls. So uh, there was a basis uh, for uh, financial contractions. Uh, they wouldn't have occurred had we didn't have, if we didn't have the expansion of fiduciary media. Had you had 100% reserve, uh, you wouldn't have had that problem. But we didn't have 100% reserve, so we had periodic booms and busts. But uh, when there's a bust, the economy can uh, adjust to it, can get out of the depression, get back to full employment and full production. But what's required if you have uh, a reduction in money and spending? You need wage rates and prices free to fall. Now, uh, in all of our previous depressions prior to 1929, wage rates and prices did fall uh, quite sharply within a fairly short period of time, and we got back to full employment and, uh, and full production. In 1929, there was a profound difference, and that was that uh, President Hoover was in the White House, and Hoover believed, along with uh, many, many other people, many businessmen and uh, writers, uh, that uh, it was wrong to cut wage rates in the face of unemployment. Uh, and they accepted the erroneous idea that uh, if you cut wage rates, that that served to reduce consumer demand and make the depression worse. Now, it's true that if you cut the wage rate of any given worker, that worker will make a smaller demand. If he earns less, he spends less. But it's fallacious to assume that all workers taken together will be spending less if there will be more workers employed as the result of the fall in wage rates. Uh, if we have uh, the average worker earning a certain wage, and now his wage falls to some extent, but there are that many more workers working at the lower wage, uh, sufficiently more workers working, uh, their consumer spending need not be any lower, it may even be greater. 
Well, uh, Hoover uh, called uh, White House conferences of the major businessmen of the country and got them to agree not to take advantage of the unemployment to reduce wage rates, uh, not to reduce wage rates in advance of reductions in prices. And the result was that the fall in wage rates in the 29 depression proceeded far, far more slowly than in any previous depression. I think in 1930, uh, when there was already mass unemployment, wage rates fell an average of 3%. Uh, even in 31, they may have fallen uh, 6 or 7%. Back in 1921, within one year, uh, the uh, fall in wage rates uh, was much bigger uh, than uh, it took several years in the Depression of 29. And the Depression of 21 was over very, very quickly. Now, when uh, you interfere with the fall in wage rates, uh, that leads to further financial contraction uh, when people are expecting that wage rates will fall. Because put yourself in the position of a firm contemplating uh, some form of investment. Here you are, you're looking at the present level of construction costs. And there's an awful lot of unemployed construction workers. There are unemployed workers producing construction materials. What will be your expectation as to the cost of construction in six months, a year or so? They think they'd be substantially lower. So when will you uh, commit to make to, to your construction project? Now, it'll, it'll all be postponed. Now, this postponement of investment spending, which took place on a massive scale in uh, 30, 31, 32, to such a degree that uh, net investment was actually a negative number in those years. When firms uh, radically curtail uh, their investment spending and are holding funds waiting uh, to make their expenditures later on uh, when they expect costs will be lower, well, what's the effect on the volume of spending now? There's less spending than there otherwise would have been. Lower sales, revenues, profits, uh, cash flow, more business failures, more bank failures, a further contraction. The depression uh, went further, the contraction was greater uh, precisely because of the failure of money wage rates to fall, prohibiting uh, their, their fall. Uh, we could have uh, gotten out of the depression uh, uh, by 1931, most likely, uh, had uh, the government not interfered uh, with wage rates. But instead, uh, the interference grew worse uh, with the New Deal. Uh, in 1932, uh, shortly before the New Deal took power, uh, the Congress was already controlled by uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, the Norris LaGuardia Act was enacted. Uh, that prohibited employers uh, from getting a federal uh, injunction against uh, labor union intimidation. Uh, so uh, that uh, gave a lot of new power to unions. In 1933, the National Recovery Act was passed. Uh, that uh, embodied uh, much of today's uh, labor law uh, the NRA was found unconstitutional, but its provisions with respect to labor were quickly reenacted under the Wagner Act. And this is what made it very easy for labor unions to organize and uh, extend their influence uh, beyond construction and the railroads, which was what they were more or less limited to in the 1920s. Uh, they could then organize uh, the steel industry, automobiles, uh, cement, uh, metalworking, etc. And what do you think uh, happened to wage rates uh, in the midst of mass unemployment in 1933 and thereafter? They started actually rising in the midst of mass unemployment. Now, uh, 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 practically uh, the day after it took office, uh, or within weeks, uh, the New Deal uh, abolished the gold standard, uh, gave itself the ability uh, to start expanding the quantity of money once again. And the quantity of money uh, did expand from 1933 on, has continued to expand to the present day. But when you have uh, the labor unions uh, greatly empowered and they're out there actually raising wage rates in the midst of mass unemployment, uh, the additional spending uh, will not have all that much effect. In fact, uh, if the labor unions are really able to go at it, uh, you can have a situation where spending rises at huge rates, but if wage rates are rising just as fast, are you making headway against unemployment? 
but you don't make headway. And we've had Latin American countries uh, where spending and prices uh, may double every year, uh, wage rates are doubling, and they've had mass unemployment alongside of massive increases in money and spending. And we could easily have had that uh, 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 going on uh, after the 30s. Uh, what happened in World War II was we had a more massive creation of money to finance the war, but the ability of the unions to raise wage rates was essentially ended. Uh, does anyone know what ended it? What major wartime measure uh, prohibited the unions from raising wage rates uh, to any degree beyond what the government was willing to permit? Well, what about World War II? What special accompaniment of the war? Well, we had all round wage and price control. Uh, the government uh, made it illegal uh, for employers to raise their prices without permission of a special government board, the Office of Price Administration, and it made it illegal uh, for unions to raise wage rates. Uh, it imposed ceiling prices on everything. Now, this doesn't mean there were zero price increases, but they were uh, very, very limited, and they were far below what corresponded to the increase in the quantity of money and the ability to spend money. Now, uh, this explains uh, how it came to be uh, that World War II was a period of full employment. Uh, it was not anything physically uh, connected with the war, it was not the need for war material. It was not the physical destruction of the war. It was not a pent up demand or anything of that kind. Here we have uh, price and wage. I put them both on the uh, vertical axis, prices and wages. Uh, here's a demand curve. Uh, let's say that uh, this represents the supply of labor. We'll just do wage rates. Here's wage rates. Here's the supply of labor. And uh, there had been this uh, downshift in demand uh, back in the 20s, uh, up to 1929. Uh, the demand for labor had been here. We had uh, full employment. But now we have a financial contraction. The demand uh, for everything, labor and goods, declines. Uh, there's a reduction in the quantity of money. The velocity of money is lower. So we have a demand here. But now President Hoover uh, is keeping wage rates up at this level. Here's a W, I'll call it H, wages Hoover. If wage rates are remaining at the pre-depression level, but now we have a decline in demand, what should you expect to happen? The quantity of labor. The quantity of labor demand is going to be down here. The supply available is up here. What is this? That's the unemployment. Now, is there a way to get out of this uh, even with this reduced demand curve? Yeah, the no. wage, rates fall. Yeah. wage rates would have to fall down to here. Uh, we'd have full employment with this lower demand curve uh, without any war. Now, uh, we didn't have that because uh, first Hoover is preventing it, and then the New Deal came in, and the unions are actually raising wage rates. Well, what we had in World War II, as I've indicated, we had a massive increase in the quantity of money and volume of spending. And wage rates uh, continued uh, to be frozen out here. I've drawn this a little bit too steeply. If wage rates are more or less frozen at this uh, pre-war level, what will be the quantity of labor demanded on this higher demand curve? It'll be out to here, right? Yeah. All right, now what is this distance? What does this represent? Shortage. A labor shortage. It's the excess of the quantity of labor demanded over the supply available. And this occurred as the result of a combination of massive increases in the money supply to pay for the war, which increased people's capacity to spend, and at the same time, wage rates were essentially frozen. So that's how we had full employment. We could have had full employment without the war. And if we had uh, uh, been able not to have the war, then we would not have needed to produce all the tanks, planes, uh, artillery shells, whatever. We'd have full employment with people producing automobiles, houses, appliances, uh, luxury goods, uh, having a higher standard of living. 
Now, I don't want to suggest that we should not have been in the war, but uh, I do want to suggest that uh, we never uh, derive prosperity from a war. Uh, it can be necessary to fight a war to preserve the freedom of the country, but uh, we don't prosper from that. We, we do it at enormous cost. Like it may be necessary uh, for you to own a gun, and if you're accosted, to pull the gun. But uh, presumably you're not going to enjoy that thing. That's not going to be a source of your enjoyment. It's something that's imposed upon you uh, by circumstances beyond your control. You have to do it. Uh, you'd rather not be in that situation. Uh, but uh, you don't want to live your life that way. Or you certainly don't prosper that way. And in World War II, the standard of living of the average person was far below what it had been in the worst years of the Depression. Uh, in the worst years of the Depression, three out of four people were working. Uh, the unemployment rate never got above 25%. That was high enough. But the three out of four who were working uh, were able to buy uh, anything that was commensurate with their earnings. Uh, the goods produced were of all very high quality. Uh, in World War II, as I've said, uh, whole categories of goods ceased to be produced. Uh, the government ordered the automobile plants stop producing automobiles. You're now going to produce tanks and jeeps and uh, uh, throughout the whole of the economy. And uh, I, well, I've described the situation. So uh, people were working. Uh, they were working long and hard, but they were getting much, much less uh, for the work they did. They were getting much less in terms of goods and services. And uh, we can see this in terms of an example with the class. Imagine the people uh, sitting in the interior of the class, uh, they're all unemployed. And uh, we're going to get into a war. I'll be the government. Uh, they'll be um, uh, producing tanks and planes for me. But now that they're working, uh, they're going to need to be supplied by you guys. They're, they have to be better off working than they were before. And you guys will be producing uh, many of the materials they use and the equipment. So uh, their output is coming to me and then going on to the battlefield. Uh, your output, or a good part of your output, is going to them. What output is coming back to remunerate you? You're not getting any output. You're working and producing. Uh, the unemployed, their output is going to the government uh, for the war effort or whatever. Uh, uh, part of the output of the previously employed, the already employed, that's going to the uh, uh, re-employed people but nothing is coming back to compensate them. It's a kind of uh, broken circle. And this very same point applies to uh, uh, non-war uh, government activity. Uh, if we're not fortunate enough uh, to get into a good war, uh, then the consumptionists have uh, other tricks up their sleeve, and the most prominent one being uh, just expand government spending. Uh, just have the government get involved in all kinds of new projects, uh, build new roads, whether they go anywhere, that's not so important, uh, build uh, dams, whatever, uh, courthouses, uh, all kinds of public works projects uh, for the sake of creating employment. Well, again, uh, the output of the unemployed is going to the government, the output of the already employed, uh, part of it is going to uh, remunerate the newly employed. Uh, what's feeding back uh, to compensate those who already had jobs. Uh, no. Nothing uh, of comparable uh, significance. Yes, Mr. Gates. Isn't it true though, that an increase in government spending helps reduce the effects of recessions? Well, you see, that's the idea that uh, an increase in government spending uh, reduces the recessions. Uh, if it can do so uh, to the extent that uh, wage rates do not rise to the same degree to the extent wage rates do not rise to the same degree. Uh, and if you have a labor union movement that has lost much of its power, which is pretty much the situation today, although it might be changing, uh, if the unions do not take advantage of the increase in money and spending uh, to raise wages, or if for whatever reason they're unable to, then the expansion in money and spending can result in additional people being employed. Uh, it's just you're increasing money and the spending it supports, and you're increasing money and spending relative to wages. Uh, would there be another way to accomplish the same result without the government increasing the quantity of money? You can't reduce taxes. 
Well, if they reduce taxes and maintain their spending, uh, how do they perform that? Well, and if they borrow, they can't keep borrowing indefinitely, uh, or the debt keeps building up. What do they have to do uh, to be able to borrow continually uh, without having to worry about uh, facing bankruptcy? They have to create money. They have to create money. So, now, I mentioned a little while back, uh, I said there are situations where maybe uh, giving the police extraordinary powers could serve to reduce the crime rate. But that's not something we would want to do, even if it were successful. In the same way, uh, there are circumstances, and maybe today is one of them, uh, where the government's power to increase the quantity of money can serve uh, to reduce unemployment and uh, stave off a depression. But this requires that the government have the power to increase the quantity of money as much as it likes. Uh, what problems uh, does that create? Well, we have con chronic inflation. What does it do to the security of any kind of pension or long-term contract? Devalued. It takes it away. And how does it affect the way people perceive their relation to the government? Yeah. Uh, just think for a moment. Uh, if the government did not have the power to create money, if the money were gold, the government can't create gold. Where must it get the money that it wants to spend? The people. From the citizens. The government has to go to the citizens and say, I need money. They would get it by taxes. Uh, are the citizens happy to pay the taxes? No. Uh, now, uh, what would be the effect of this arrangement where whatever money the government spent, it had to get from the citizens, what would be the effect on the popularity of spending proposals? You see, if the government doesn't have the option of creating money, and which would mean it also can't borrow money for very long, if you borrow money without the ability to create money, you're headed for bankruptcy. They have to be utterly reckless and irresponsible to do that. I don't think our government is that uh, reckless. Maybe California's government is, but I don't think the, the federal government is. So uh, uh, borrowing is out as an option if they can't create money which means the only way to finance additional spending is to raise taxes or to cut other spending. Well, uh, now imagine in that environment, uh, someone has a new spending proposal. Uh, he's uh, calculated how many working mothers would be benefited by publicly financed daycare centers. And he can show you uh, how many of them would, would be helped by this. Uh, but uh, suppose at the same time, we have to raise people's taxes to pay for it. Well, how do you think that would affect the equation? A lot, of A lot of people would say, well, I sympathize with the working mothers, but I just can't afford to pay f uh, to solve their problem. So uh, they'll have to work it out a different way. Now think how differently this appears if the government has its own money and can finance that or any other project without having to raise taxes because it has the ability to print the funds if it wishes. Well, in that light, uh, does it appear that there is a necessary closely connected cost uh, for this project? No. no, it doesn't. And that's why we get the present status of political debate. We have two sides. Uh, there's one side, the friends of humanity and all that's good. <laughs> And uh, what they do is they enumerate the benefits of a proposal. They say, well, look at these poor working mothers. Uh, don't you sympathize with them? Uh, now their children will be taken care of. Uh, they can work. And this is all very nice and fine. And what decent human being could be against this? Well, if there were no cost, no decent human being could be against it. And if there is no perceptible, closely connected cost, what is the likelihood of that and many, many other measures being enacted? They then uh, will get through, and the opponents are made to appear as nasty old curmudgeons. They're just against uh, what's good for the people. And this is how uh, political debate routinely goes on. The liberals, uh, they're compassionate, and they love everybody, and they just want everybody to be better off. And the, there's those nasty old meanies, the conservatives, they just want people to suffer. Well, uh, they're looking at, at the cost, but uh, most people are unable to see the cost because the government doesn't have to raise taxes. They can just create new and additional money. So what do you think this has done to the size of the government? 
expanded. It's greatly expanded. One of the major effects of this change in the monetary system has been a radical expansion in the size of the government in the conviction, the mistaken belief that the government can provide free benefits. And it's totally reversed the way uh, people see themselves in relation to the government. If the government had to collect money from the citizens, the citizens would then realize that the government is dependent on them. The government would be financially dependent on the people. But when the government has the power to create money, the people think they are financially dependent on the government. Because the government is now the source of their money. But you see, you're reversing the relationship between the citizen and the state. Instead of the citizen being primary, instead of the citizen having the last word, and the government being the servant beholden to the citizen, the citizen feels that he's the servant beholden to the government. This is a total reversal of the original system of government that we had. And if there were no other reason, this would be a sufficient, I think, uh, to, uh, on behalf of the gold standard, and to maintain that standard, when there's uh, a recession, get out of it, not by the creation of more money, even if, that's, if that would do it, but get out of it by uh, the reduction in wage rates and prices. That would be consistent with a system of small government uh, a system where people could count on the future buying power of money, uh, not think, not fear that when they get old and retire, uh, whatever sums they have, uh, if they live long enough, will be worth only a fraction of what they were uh, when they started. Yes? You think today, though, I mean, I, I see more of versus a reduction in wage rates, more of a control that with wage bans, to where your wages... Um, as a worker are not going up proportionately with the cost of living. And companies, rather than saying, okay, if I'm paying you $10 an hour, you're gonna go down to $8 an hour, yeah. they're just saying, you're not gonna get a 3% increase every year at some point, the job only pay X amount. Yeah, re real, wages, real wages can fall uh, to the extent that the rise in prices surpasses the rise but in real wages, in money wages. Cutting. Yeah. It's just cutting it instead of increasing it. Yeah, but uh, what is responsible in large part for that uh, is uh, the tremendous expansion in government and the extent to which it undercuts the people's ability to save as a result. And uh, also uh, uh, closely related, uh, the idea uh, that regulation is costless. And uh, 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 one of the reasons for wages not keeping pace is we enact more and more regulations that impose costs, and uh, there has to be something else uh, that the cost of which will not go up so much. That's, that's labor. Okay, uh, so... Uh, we could have uh, full employment, uh, full production. Uh, we don't need uh, government boondoggles. Uh, we could have it with a modest, uh, small government. Uh, let's go further in uh, the analysis of the implications of consumptionism. I refer to the belief that population growth is a source of prosperity. And how is that supposed to be the case? Well, uh, population growth will create more consumers who ha each have their own consumer desires. Uh, in the years after World War II, when we had the baby boom, uh, consumptionists were uh, very excited. Uh, they were looking forward uh, to the uh, surge in children, uh, reaching marriageable age, and then they'll need houses, furniture, automobiles, everything to go with it. And that's uh, enough new additional consumer desire, they thought, uh, to keep all of the uh, factories and the rest of the economic system humming, uh, producing for them. Uh, so the idea is all we need is more people and they'll make an economic contribution by virtue of desiring things. You see, we allegedly have a shortage of needs and desires. Our needs and desires are not up to our ability to produce, but with more people, uh, maybe we have a shot. Well, uh, something is overlooked. Uh, what's the effect uh, to the extent these new people, when they reach uh, adulthood, uh, have, to have to find jobs? How must the consumptionists view them then? It's growth. When they're looking for jobs, 
uh, keep in mind uh, the consumptionist uh, view of things. They are fixed among them. There's uh, allegedly a fixed amount of work to be done. Uh, keep in mind, here's the situation. Uh, here's our starting point. And we're able to produce more than we need and desire. But now, if we have more people, uh, uh, first we have little children, they need baby food, toys, and bicycles. Uh, so that allegedly means some increase in uh, consumer demand. We move it from here to here. And then when they get married and need houses, uh, automobiles and all the rest of it, well, that will move the demand uh, much further over. So uh, in what capacity does the additional population allegedly make an economic contribution? In its capacity as consumers. Now, if they go to work, and we look down here, if this was our full employment point originally, and uh, we're working with better machinery. We have this unemployment, and we have this surplus overproduction unemployment. Uh, how will uh, the extra people help if, besides uh, consuming more, they want to work more? If here they are, they're, they're going to work uh, on this uh, more efficient production function, what will be the effect on output? Yeah. They'll increase the output, and will we have solved the problem? They'll have provided desires equal to the old output, but now these uh, foolish people, by insisting on working, what have they done to the output? The same. They've increased it further. Yeah. So have we caught up? Have we solved the problem? No. Uh, what would it take to solve the problem from the perspective of the consumptionists? If they don't work. Yeah, if, they, if these additional people will be gracious enough uh, to have houses, furniture, whatever, but not work. Uh, the ideal is that they be bums, and that's how they will make their economic contribution. See, the idea of the consumptionists is that the producers are producing more than they, the producers, need or desire. That's the surplus of S over D. The producers only need and desire DD, but they're producing SS, bigger. So the problem is an inadequacy of desire. And now they allegedly require another set of people who will be gracious enough to consume without producing. And so their consumption without production will allegedly balance these guys' production without consumption. It's the argument that the uh, producers have this absurd desire to produce without consuming. And they need a class of parasites who will be gracious enough to consume without producing. Then they'll be happy. They can continue working and producing beyond what they want, and the others will keep them busy by consuming. Yes, Mr. Doe. Um, can you comment on the uh, well, we'll begin. I think that'll come up in the very next uh, point we discuss. Actually, yeah. I think I got a good example about the policy you mentioned because a lot of my friends are international students and they are not allowed to work. Uh -huh. Yeah. So they're basically they are just consuming all the time. They are not producing at all. Yeah, I mean, foreign students here in the United States, uh, and uh, anyone, uh, uh, you need special government permission. If you're a foreigner, you need special permission to be able to work. You have to get a precious green card. Now, why do they make it that hard to work? Well, it's the idea of there's a scarce, precious stock of work to be done, yeah. and we have to guard it. It's the same issue, the same mentality as the union's make work scheme. Uh, and they want to stop people from working. They fear people's working. And uh, here, uh, it's uh, an even bigger issue. Uh, the consumptionists believe uh, the extra people would be valuable uh, as consumers and harmful as producers. Now, the reality is the only way in which the extra people are economically valuable is as producers. Uh, we don't need non-producing consumers. No one is gaining uh, from people consuming at his expense. So uh, you yeah. are saying that our government has been uh, consumption? Yeah, uh, our government is consumptionist. Uh, the labor unions are consumptionist. Uh, major economic authors are consumptionist, like Lord Keynes, uh, all of the textbooks that follow his analysis. Uh, it's uh, a very widespread phenomenon. Whoever thinks machinery causes unemployment, whoever thinks uh, women take jobs from men, whoever thinks that uh, immigrants are taking jobs from natives, uh, all of these are consumptionists. Whoever thinks it's necessary to make work, that's a consumptionist. 
whoever thinks that uh, there's this uh, benefit we're talking about uh, from extra people uh, operating merely as consumers and that we're threatened if they go to work, uh, that's consumptionism. Okay. And there are yet further ways, uh, and we'll, we'll look at them. Uh, I refer to the related support uh, for a policy of imperialism. And this uh, had its main application uh, back uh, in the days of World War I, uh, or so it was thought. Uh, uh, according to uh, many leftist authors, uh, such as Lenin and, uh, uh, and other uh, of his followers, all of the advanced uh, capitalist countries in Europe had a problem of overproduction. Uh, so here's France, here's Germany, here's uh, Great Britain. They all allegedly have a problem of overproduction. And what do they need to solve it? Consumers. They need consumers. They need consumer desires. And where can they find them? Well, uh, population growth at home, maybe that's one possibility. But there's something very similar and much, much bigger to be found abroad. And that is the vast populations of impoverished backward countries. Uh, above all, uh, China and India. Now, how does the consumptionist perceive uh, such countries? Well, uh, he looks, at, first of all, at the, uh, the magnitude of their populations, and then he thinks of all of the goods that they don't have, but which people in the advanced countries have been uh, gotten uh, uh, conned into wanting to have. Uh, to, to apply this uh, in present terms, uh, a consumptionist would think all right, here we are in the United States. Uh, we've succeeded in getting people to buy so many automobiles per thousand people. I don't know what the number is. I'm sure it's several hundred uh, per thousand people. And we have uh, however many television sets per thousand and cell phones and on and on, good by good. And now the consumptionist looks at China and India, other uh, heavily populated, very poor countries, and what's he thinking? He's thinking, well... Uh, how many uh, automobiles do they have per, per thousand people? Let's imagine in the U.S. we have 600 automobiles per thousand people, and in India they have five automobiles per thousand people. Now the consumptionists will be thinking, boy, oh boy, that means we have a potential of getting them to take 595 more automobiles per thousand people over in India, and then think of how many millions of thousands of people they have. Or, uh, 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 maybe it's a million thousand people, a million units of a thousand people, each of whom, uh, that'll give them a population of a billion, and uh, each of these thousand is a potential outlet for 595 automobiles. We'll multiply 595 times uh, a million, uh, and here we are, India becomes a potential market for 595 million automobiles. And now apply the same thing uh, with television sets, uh, uh, microwave ovens, uh, one thing after another. And the way the consumptionists view uh, these heavily populated, very, very poor countries is they're uh, an immense potential market. This is just great. If we get our hands on this, that'll solve our problem of overproduction uh, for generations. We'll be busy night and day uh, serving their markets. We've got additional markets. Well, allegedly, uh, this idea occurred uh, not just to one country, it occurred to France, Germany, uh, England, all at the same time. And it was such a great prize uh, to get these markets that they ended up going to war over them. <laughs> now, uh, just think, what would you have had you gotten it? Uh, the way a consumptionist views markets is, he thinks it's a set of consumer needs and desires and if the people need something, uh, uh, you'll provide it to them, and you'll have the work to do of producing it. Uh, are people a market merely because they have needs? Uh, uh, which country is a bigger market in the world, uh, India or Japan? Japan? Japan is a much bigger market. Uh, which country has a greater uh, set of needs, more urgent needs? India. India, by far. Uh, India has a billion people. Japan has not too much more than 100 million. Uh, the standard of living in Japan is not much lower than our own. Uh, the standard of living in India is a small fraction of ours. Uh, India has immense needs, but uh, does that give them the ability to buy? Uh, do you have the ability, does a beggar have, uh, who has a desperate need for a good meal, does that give him the ability to buy the meal? 
No, uh, need is not the source of demand. It's not the basis of demand. That's one of the points has that makes very well, that need is not demand. We should not confuse the two. Uh, nor uh, is mere um, creation of money uh, demand. Uh, it's not even just money. Uh, India's problem is not that they lack rupees. Uh, the Indian government could easily manufacture billions of new and additional rupees. That's their monetary unit. Uh, would that enable them to buy more in the world market? What would happen if they manu manufactured the rupees? They would devalue the, uh, the value of the rupee would plunge, and the additional rupees might end up, the larger supply of rupees might end up actually buying less than the, the original supply. Uh, it, the plunge could be greater than the increase in the quantity. Well, uh, what does a country need uh, to be able to buy? What does an individual need uh, to be able to buy? Well, it's not just money, because money can be manufactured. They need to be able to produce goods and services which you can sell and get the money that way. Uh, those countries are markets to the extent that they are producers. Japan is a major market because Japan is a major producer. Each country is a market to the extent that it's a producer. Uh, its production gives it the wherewithal to make purchases. Uh, individuals are buyers, they're consumers, to the extent that they're producers and have earned the money by virtue of production. Now, uh, the consumptionists uh, uh, do not want uh, these countries to be producers. Uh, see, they think that they're valuable uh, simply as taking our goods. They think they're valuable as a source of our exports, as uh, receiving our exports. How does the consumptionist uh, react uh, to the prospect of their imp of the, us importing from them? How's he reacting right now to the imports from Japan and China? He doesn't like it. He, he fears the imports. He doesn't want the imports. What would it be? The, what's his view of the ideal arrangement that would really be a benefit to us? That we export to the maximum possible extent while importing to the minimum possible extent, and this shows up in the terminology of a favorable balance of, of trade. This is what uh, the press thinks is favorable, that we should export uh, greater than we import, uh, ideally only export and not import. Well, that is not uh, an advantageous way uh, to conduct trade. Uh, the value of, of foreign trade is, in fact, in the imports. That's uh, how we get rewarded uh, for our, uh, our foreign trade. Yes, uh, Mr. Rokhani. So, how does the consumptionist think that people get the money to buy their goods if they don't want them to produce anything? How does he think they get the money uh, to buy their goods? Now, the consumption is a variation, uh, one answer, and I think this will relate to the question someone raised about the drive for exports. It was Mr. Doe. Uh, one way that the consumptionist thinks they'll get money is we'll give it to them and uh, we'll have exports that we finance. Uh, uh, so uh, their idea is, uh, if, they, if they're not earning the money, well, we'll give them the money, and then we'll have the pleasure of being able to sell them the goods. Now, this has been compared to uh, someone, a restaurant, let's say, uh, that employs a doorman uh, to give passers-by $50 bills, uh, but only on condition that they spend the money in that restaurant. Mm. Now, do you think that would be a reasonable way of doing business? No. Well, uh, but there are many people who you think would be uh, reasonably intelligent. Uh, they think that uh, we benefit. Uh, we benefit economically from the foreign aid that we give. Why do we benefit? Because the recipients of the aid will spend the money we give them in our economy. Now, uh, there may be some businesses that benefit, but uh, the people who pay for it are losing. Uh, and we might as well uh, just take the money from the American taxpayer, transfer it to the business that's going to sell the goods, uh, then they'd have the benefit, they could skip the sale. Uh, this is a, a, an imbecilic policy, uh, yet uh, it's advocated. And uh, the same doctrine, uh, the uh, balance, uh, the uh, 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 the alleged benefit uh, from uh, having these alleged foreign markets 
uh, surfaced in the Vietnam War. Uh, the left often argued that uh, the United States was in Vietnam to secure a toehold in the uh, vast markets of Southeast Asia. Now, the way they saw markets, as I've explained, is that means you give your goods away for free, which would have been a pretty stupid arrangement from our point of view. But uh, it appears the uh, people of v uh, Vietnam who are uh, going to get free goods, they're too smart to go for a deal like that. Uh, so we have to send in the army uh, so we'll then have the benefit of being able to give our goods away for free. And World War I was fought for the privilege of giving goods away for free. That's the uh, consumptionist argument. Now, maybe Imperial Germany was in World War I for such an idiot reason, but uh, I don't think Britain was. Now, uh, let me uh, jump ahead to this, uh, to advertising. I, I refer uh, to the belief that advertising is inherently fraudulent, yet economically necessary. Uh, from what perspective, in the consumptionist view of things, would advertising be inherently fraudulent by its very nature? Because you uh, you me? Uh, me? Yeah, we really don't need any of this. Uh, we really just need a loaf of bread and a monk's habit and a, a stool and a, a straw mat. And that's our needs. And the advertisers have conned us into wanting uh, this whole array of things that we don't need. So it's inherently fraudulent uh, on the foundation of the idea that our true, genuine, legitimate needs are next to nothing. And the advertisers are uh, catering uh, to needs and desires beyond those of a monk. So that's why uh, they're uh, viewed as, why it's viewed as inherently fraudulent. What is the perspective from which advertising is viewed at the same time as economically necessary? Yes, Mr. Gates? Well, it, it informs the public of the products. We've got them having to go out and do the research. I'm asking from the perspective of the consumptionists. Yes? To close the, the gap between the uh, uh, fully employment and to, close the, to, to decrease on Yeah, to the extent that the advertisers are successful, uh, it will move the demand curve. It'll move the demand curve. Uh, if they can con the people enough, well, maybe uh, they'd make the demand equal to the supply. And they'd eliminate the problem of unemployment and overproduction. Uh, so uh, that's how the consumptionists think advertising makes a contribution. Precisely in getting people to have uh, desires for things they don't need, it, uh, it serves to enable other people uh, to be employed in producing these things. Yes, Mr. Doe? I don't hear you. You can decrease the supply if you do better market. Yes, but you see, the, the, the consumptionist see, sees that as precisely the problem, because suppose we produce only this much, then how many people can be employed if this is uh, the production function? If people will only take this much, how much labor do we need to produce that much? But instead of wasting the labor to produce that product, instead of wasting the labor to produce that product. Well, we're talking about the whole economy here, not just exactly. an isolated product. Uh, so, uh, cutting the production is not a solution because uh, then you just have the unemployment. Well, not, not cutting the production, just producing more what people want. Yeah, but the consumptionist says they don't want anything. <laughs> they really don't want anything. Now, that's nonsense, of course. Uh, uh, there's no limit to what people want, and so we really don't have this kind of problem. But I'm just trying to develop uh, what the consumptionists uh, believe is, is a problem. And they, uh, they think that uh, advertising, uh, while inherently fraudulent, is economically necessary. Uh, they have this uh, moral uh, contradictory, con uh, this contradictory moral view uh, with respect to advertising and also with respect to war. Uh, from a moral point of view, they have to condemn war, but from an economic point of view, they think it's really good. And from a moral point of view, they condemn advertising, but from an economic point of view, they think it's really good. Now, uh, in the days before the environmentalists, 
uh, the, the consumptionists uh, might very well have a positive view of science and technology and think that uh, in our present society, uh, science and technology uh, perversely work as evils. But today, of course, the perhaps more consistent uh, that, that would largely be environmentalists who think that science and technology are evils to begin with, and uh, therefore it's not surprising uh, that they're causing unemployment, uh, at least according to consumptionism. Now, uh, it follows from this, uh, this next point, a belief in the purposelessness and irrationality of economic life. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, let's suppose that uh, the advertisers have done uh, such a good job uh, that people are willing to buy everything that can be produced, and we have full employment. Uh, now, from the perspective of the consumptionists, what have we got when we've got it? Let's say the advertisers have gotten people to want the equivalent of all that we're able to produce. So uh, we're going along at full employment and we're producing all this stuff. Okay, well, what have we got when we've got it from the perspective of the consumptionists? Zero demand. All uh, meaningless stuff. It's all meaningless. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a society where everyone is very busy devoting his life to the production of things nobody needs. That's how the consumptionist views things. They think we don't, their view is that uh, the far greater part of our production is essentially junk. That's how they think of it. And yet, for prosperity, uh, we need to keep people very busy producing all of this stuff. Now, I think uh, views of this kind uh, uh, serve uh, to promote environmentalism. Uh, how could someone advocate uh, measures that uh, would reduce production hugely? Like uh, a UN panel uh, called for, uh, not all that long ago, a 60% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. And if you think of all of the things that emit carbon dioxide, I think our cars emit it, the power plants emit it, our appliances uh, are part of it. Uh, what would happen to our level of production uh, if we had to curtail carbon dioxide emissions 60%? It would decrease, it would decrease incredibly, uh, maybe even more than 60%. Well, how can anyone uh, advocate such a thing? Well, if you think that 60% of our production is useless junk, then uh, it's not such a big deal. And I think that's how uh, many, many environmentalists view it. Uh, they're uh, largely consumptionists. Uh, they don't appreciate the value of the economic system. Uh, they don't appreciate the products. Uh, but if we value the products, uh, well, if we value the products, uh, we don't view advertising as fraudulent, uh, there are certainly some fraudulent advertisers, but uh, that is not the basic nature of the activity. Uh, the reason we have advertising is the producer and the consumer in a division of labor society are separate people, and the consumers uh, don't automatically know what's available on what terms or where, and the basic function of advertising is to provide that kind of information. And uh, what advertising does, uh, uh, advertising does not increase overall demand. Advertising serves to switch the direction of demand. People become aware of some products more than they otherwise would have. They decide to buy those. But uh, what would they have done with their money otherwise? Would they have just stuffed it under, the, under their mattress? Uh, they'd have bought some other things. Uh, so it's a diversion of demand. Uh, advertising uh, contributes, uh, may contribute to production uh, to the extent that uh, uh, people become aware of things that they so much want to have that they're willing to go out and do extra work to earn the money to buy the things. Uh, to that extent, advertising uh, would serve to increase overall production. Uh, for the rest, it's enabling people uh, to consume in a better way, a more knowledgeable way uh, than they otherwise would have. Okay, let me ask uh, if there are any uh, questions, comments. I haven't dealt with each and every uh, point I had on the list, but I think I have covered uh, the most important ones. Uh, so let me hear uh, uh, any comments, reactions uh, in the last few minutes. Uh, yes, Ms. Buckles? So, in a sense, are you saying that consumptionists are like 
the left, people on the left, and the productionists are people on the right? I would say to a large degree that's true. I wouldn't say perfectly. Uh, I'm sure you'd find uh, exceptions. Uh, but I would say, uh, you see, the way cons if you're a consumptionist, uh, you're viewing the economic system as paradoxical, uh, deriving benefit from moral evils, war and advertising. And uh, most consumptionists, uh, prior to the advent of environmentalism, uh, I think there was a huge overlap between consumptionism and socialism. Uh, socialists were leading advocates of consumptionism, like Lenin, and uh, their view would be uh, it's under capitalism that you have these perverse outcomes. Under capitalism, war is economically uh, advantageous, uh, fraud is advantageous, uh, science and technology cause unemployment. But under socialism, science and technology will work for the good of mankind, uh, no one will gain from war or fraud. Uh, so they thought uh, it's an indictment of capitalism and they would be socialists. Uh, today, I think uh, they would largely be environmentalists. Um, yes. Uh, does the gold standard always have a cycle of boom and bust? Does the gold standard always have a cycle of boom and bust? No, it depends on what kind. Uh, see, a 100% reserve gold standard would not. 100% reserve gold standard would not allow the creation of money to feed the boom, nor create the potential for the destruction of that money in the bust. But didn't we have that? And no, we never had 100% reserve gold standard. We always had a fractional reserve gold standard. Uh, the banks could expand the quantity of money up to a point, uh, but then they'd reach a limit. They'd have to stop the process, and when that uh, occurred, uh, things would go into reverse. All right, anything else? All right, I hope you found this discussion of interest. I think it uh, deals with a lot of important matters, and hopefully it gives you the framework uh, to, to understand some of these things. Uh, well, I, at least I hope so. So I'll uh, see you all next week. Have a good one. I want to uh, uh, tonight go into uh, Say's Law of Markets. Uh, we didn't completely finish the discussion of productionism versus consumptionism. Uh, maybe there'll be some opportunity to uh, go back to that. But uh, I, I do want to start off with uh, a discussion of Say's Law. Um, Say uh, was a, an early 19th century French economist who was a uh, popularizer of the ideas of Adam Smith uh, in France. I have in parenthesis uh, James Mill's Law of Markets. James Mill was an early 19th century British economist uh, who, in my judgment, uh, gave uh, a sounder exposition than, than even Say. Uh, to understand what Say's Law is all about, uh, we have to begin by making a distinction uh, between two concepts of demand. Uh, one is uh, monetary demand, which we've been working with up to now. Uh, that can be understood as the amount of money spent to buy goods or services, the amount of money spent. That's the D in our equation, the price level equals D divided by S. That's uh, monetary demand. Uh, then there is a further concept, real demand, uh, which is different than monetary demand. Uh, real demand can be understood as the monetary demand uh, adjusted for changes in the wage and price level. It's the monetary demand adjusted uh, for changes in the wage and price level, or uh, perhaps better still, it's the goods and services the monetary demand actually buys. The real demand is the goods and services you're actually able to buy by virtue of the money you spend. The goods and services, what you can actually obtain uh, for the money you spend, that's the real demand. And uh, there can be a profound difference between real demand and monetary demand uh, to the extent that a, a smaller monetary demand at one point in time uh, can uh, very well represent a larger real demand than a larger monetary demand at another point in time. So uh, it would be possible, for example, uh, for today's 12 trillion of monetary demand, 
uh, to be a larger real demand, taking monetary demand today is uh, equal roughly to uh, current GDP, uh, today's monetary demand uh, as represented by uh, today's <coughs> GDP of 12 trillion uh, could very well turn out to be a larger real demand than some future monetary demand of 120 trillion uh, if uh, when the uh, monetary demand got to be 120 trillion prices had increased by more than tenfold. Imagine that uh, some year in the future, uh, maybe 25, 50 years from now, uh, uh, monetary GDP is up to 120 trillion, and uh, by that time, uh, prices are 20 times higher. Well, how much would 120 trillion buy compared to uh, what today's 12 trillion buys if prices were 20 times higher? Depend on what? Pardon me? Real demand. Well, what would real demand be if? How much would you get for 120 trillion if prices were 20 times what they are today? Yes? One half. One half as much. The real demand would be half as great as it is today if prices were uh, 20 times higher. So uh, it's possible for uh, a smaller monetary demand uh, to represent a larger real demand uh, than a larger monetary demand. It depends on prices. Uh, another way to look at the same thing, uh, it's not all that long since the uh, Italian lira uh, disappeared, uh, but which were represented a larger real demand? Uh, uh, a million Italian lira or uh, a thousand U.S. dollars? A thousand U.S. dollars. Uh, uh, the lira had an exchange rate of, I think, about 1,600 or so to the dollar. Uh, $1,000 uh, was the equivalent of a million six hundred thousand lira. So uh, a mere million lira uh, was worth less than a thousand dollars. It would buy less, uh, represented a lesser real demand. So uh, the number of monetary units that are spent. Uh, that does not signify anything about uh, the, the height of real demand. To know real demand, you have to know uh, not just the monetary demand, but also the price level. Uh, the monetary demand, the extent to which it's a real demand, depends on the price level. Now, uh, according to productionism, which we spent a lot of time on last week, as I put it in point three, uh, there is no inherent limit to aggregate real demand. Aggregate real demand has no fixed limit. And we represented that by uh, drawing an asymptotic uh, demand curve. Uh, there is no uh, inherent limit. Uh, potentially, uh, aggregate real demand is unlimited. There's no limit to our need and desire for wealth. That's potentially unlimited. Uh, the actual limit at any given time uh, depends on the willingness and ability of people to produce. That's what I italicize here. Uh, uh, real demand, uh, while it has no inherent limit, uh, no potential limit, uh, its actual limit depends on uh, the willingness and ability of people pr to produce. If uh, they're willing and able to produce more, then what will happen in the face of a given monetary demand? Suppose the monetary demand is uh, an unchanged number of dollars, however many billions or trillions, and we assume that's unchanged. Uh, what will happen uh, if and to the extent that people become able and willing to produce more, and this larger volume of output is sold for the same given expenditure of money? More value in the real demand. There'll be greater real demand because what will be happening to prices? And you are, I'm sorry, I don't see your name there. Okay, Mr. Davis, thank you. Prices would drop prices based would on extra production. Okay, prices would fall. Uh, prices would fall. And <coughs> what would be the effect of that on the ability of the same aggregate expenditure to buy goods and services? You buy more. You buy more. You buy more. 
Now, uh, we can illustrate this. I, I say, uh, uh, if people are able and willing to produce more, then uh, given uh, the monetary demand, the price level will drop and the real demand will be increased. The actual quantity of output demanded, the actual quantity demanded, is determined by the aggregate supply curve, uh, which can be uh, shown as a vertical line SS. And here uh, we have it. Let's see if we can enlarge this. Okay. Can you all see this in the rear? Okay, it's titled Productionism and Say's Law. Notice we've got the productionist aggregate demand curve, the same one we were looking at last time. Uh, the only difference is now we've added in various uh, aggregate supply curves, or you can call them aggregate supply lines, because we're showing them as just uh, so much. Uh, if we have this initial aggregate supply, SS, uh, equal to a quantity 1.0, uh, then that uh, generates a price level of 1.0. And what is the quantity demanded along this demand curve at the price level 1.0? One. 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 So the quantity demanded is equal to the supply available at that price level. Now, what would happen if we could double the aggregate supply uh, to S prime, S prime? Uh, this is a quantity of 2.0. Uh, what would be required for that to be demanded? Price. All right, if the price level is had, then the quantity demanded would be doubled with the same expenditure, twice the uh, volume of supply in the face of the same expenditure of money would have the price level and make that same expenditure adequate to buy the doubled supply. And similarly, if the supply were to quadruple, well, the same expenditure would be sufficient to buy quadruple the supply at what price level? At one quarter and eight times at an eighth, ten times at a tenth, and on uh, without limit, a hundred times at a hundred. Yes, Mr. Wright. In this curve, then, does wages remain static? Okay, a very good question. What's happening to wages here? What is happening to wages? That's a very important question. Well, that will depend on what's happening to the supply of labor. Now, there are two possibilities. When production increases, uh, there are basically two possible sources of an increase in production. One is that uh, people are doing correspondingly more work. And we have uh, the same output uh, per unit of labor. We're applying more units. There could be more hours uh, per worker, or it could be more people uh, working. Now, to that extent, uh, if we had the same uh, quantity of money and the same volume of payrolls in the economy, uh, if there were the same total payrolls, and we have uh, more and more units of labor contending for the same total payrolls, what would be the effect on uh, the wage per unit of labor? Yes, Mr. Woody? Down. It would be going down exactly as this. Uh, imagine that we had, uh, on the one side in the economy, uh, say the demand for consumers' goods is $12 trillion, roughly today's GDP. Imagine that, uh, at the same time, total payrolls were $10 trillion and the total payrolls remain 10 trillion, the total consumer spending remained 12 trillion, and now if in 50 years, uh, the only change were that we had twice the people working, uh, performing twice the labor, uh, well, we could presumably produce twice as much, very possibly. In that case, what would be the effect on prices? Yeah. They'd be halved, but what would also be the effect on wages? Be They'd be halved. But now there's a different way that uh, the output can be increased, and, and what would that be, apart from the increase in the supply of labor? Technology. Yeah, Technology. economic progress, uh, scientific and technological mm -hmm. progress, capital accumulation, a rise in the productivity of labor. So now suppose that uh, what is responsible is uh, not more labor, we have the same labor, assume, but it's become twice as productive. We're producing twice as much per unit of labor on the average. So uh, the supply of products has doubled, and so what will happen to the prices of products? They'll have, but uh, the supply of labor hasn't increased. We have the same supply of labor and the same monetary demand for labor, so what would be true of wage rates? They would be unchanged. Money wage rates would be unchanged. But what would have happened to real wage rates understood 
as the goods and services the worker can actually obtain with the money he earns. They would have doubled. The doubling of production, in this case, uh, would have doubled real wages. To the extent that uh, increases in production proceed from increases in the output per unit of labor, the effect is to raise real wages. And the effect of any increase in production, whether it's from more output per worker or from more workers, either way, it will increase the real demand for output. Now, uh, let's look at a couple of implications of uh, uh, Say's law, which we actually have here. Uh, uh, you can understand uh, the meaning of Say's law. Notice what is determining where real demand actually is at any given point, at any given time. What is it that puts real demand here, then puts it here, then here, then here, then here? It's supply. Uh, what is determining real demand is supply. Uh, uh, aggregate real demand is being determined by aggregate supply. See, uh, if we took away the supply lines, and we'd have this uh, productionist aggregate demand curve, that's showing that real demand uh, is potentially limitless, but at any given time, it is something definite, and what's determining where it is at any given time is uh, aggregate production and supply. And this is Say's law. Uh, Say's law is uh, most often stated uh, as supply creates its own demand. That's the most popular uh, shorthand statement of Say's law. Supply creates its own demand. And that should be understood uh, in the light of this kind of diagram, that uh, in the face of a given aggregate expenditure of money, uh, more production and supply are uh, enlarging the quantity demanded to absorb the additional production and supply <coughs> by way of bringing down prices. And if it's a larger supply of labor that's involved, uh, bringing down wage rates too. Now, what's the implication uh, of this as to uh, how much output